you ca- you cannot punish someone for making the wrong decision. You should learn from it and try not to repeat it again. But if you punish someone really harshly for making the wrong move, people will stop thinking outside the box and will continue doing the safe thing. And that's not how you build a great company. Hi, and welcome back to Reflect Forward. I'm your host, Carrie Siggins, and I'm so glad you were here today. Oh, today my guest is so much fun. It is Anna Kraft, who is the CEO and founder of Xena Workwear. Xena designs safety boots, stylish and functional, made specifically for women. And I met her when I did a speech at the Women in Steel Conference in 2023. And I knew I had to have her on the show. She has an amazing story. She moved to the United States from Germany. She has an engineering background background and she started Xena Workwear out of frustration because she would have to wear safety boots in her manufacturing job and she was tired of how clunky they were and how everything seemed to be designed for men. And I know this, I have my own pair of steel toed boots that I have to wear when I go into any plants and I hate them. And so she started this company in 2019 and had no idea about anything about design and it's a growing success and it's just amazing. I love her leadership style. She is just so fantastic and I can't wait for you to meet her. So hang tight and I'll be right back with Anna. Welcome back everyone. I am so excited to have Anna Kraft with me today. Anna, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me today, Carrie. I'm so excited about this conversation. So you are the founder and CEO of Xena Workwear, and I can't wait to dive into your story uh, because I too can relate to wearing clunky, chunky, awful looking work boots. But I'd like you to first tell us a little bit about Xena Workwear and what you do. I started Xena in 2019. I should start with the fact that I never planned to launch a safety footwear company. I don't have a fashion background. I studied engineering in Germany and actually loved my job in the manufacturing industry after I moved to the U.S. But one thing I truly hated were my clunky work boots and I had multiple pairs under my desk. You can probably relate. (laughs) I went to so many safety shoe stores and had so many shoe trucks come over to our company and had a collection of safety boots that I hated. And then I discovered the shrink it and pink it concept that traditional companies apply where they take a men's product, make it smaller and make it pink or purple. And thought that's this is not what professional women want. And decided to launch the first stylish safety shoe that is actually designed on a woman's foot. So we launched in 2019 with just one style. For those who can have access to video, that's the gravity model. Decided to launch with just one product to see if there's a product market fit. And we got so many orders from the very beginning and we're able to expand our product line. So it's been a wild ride since 2019. I love that. And how did COVID impact you? I mean, starting a business right before COVID, I'm sure brought along its own set of challenges. What was that like? You know, it was kind of good and bad for so many businesses. In our case, the downside was that so many of our customers were sent home. A lot of engineering, everyone who is still on the manufacturing floor had to come in but a lot of engineers got sent home to work remotely but the good part about COVID I shouldn't say good part about COVID it really helped us to build out our online presence because we launched through a website and we're shipping products from our warehouse so more and more people were more comfortable ordering products online so that was helpful in the process to to help people get more comfortable with online purchases and we of course tried to make the whole ordering process as easy as possible with free exchanges and returns. So we learned a lot along the way without having an e-com background. That was a lot to learn. So how did you go about doing that? What did you study in school? I studied in Southern Germany, and that was a very unique program that was designed by the automotive industry in Southern mm-hmm. Germany. And it was it's called International Project Engineering. So I have a very broad engineering background. We studied electrical engineer, thermo and fluid dynamics, material science, manufacturing engineering, and it had a huge focus on project management and some languages. So my role was to be 
a project manager and work with different specialists, but I was not a specialist in any of those areas. My goal was to get either a master's in electrical engineering, so I would <laughs> be an expert in one area or start a business. And by the end of that one year, we decided to start a company instead of going the engineering route. So that was unexpected. But I still apply a ton of things I learned, especially in manufacturing, engineering, and material science for safety shoe development. All the boots have to go through ESCM testing at an independent lab. There are so many different safety certifications like electric, ha electric hazard, static dissipative. So it's, it's fun to be able to leverage some of that knowledge. Absolutely. And so this is so fascinating. I love it going into design and workwear fashion. I love that. So how did you get started? So you knew that there was this potential for a market, but going into something that you didn't have any experience in, what did you do? How did you figure that? How did you figure out where to get started? Yeah. So initially I learned, I wrote a business plan and did a market analysis to evaluate if there was a real need need in the market. And I actually waited for two years. And to me, it was so obvious that there was a gap in the market and I waited for somebody else to fill this gap and nothing happened. So I wrote a business plan, bought the ESTM standards, learned everything possible about the testing that was necessary. And I worked with designer, shoe designer to push the boundaries of designs while being able to pass all the necessary testing. So that was a very interesting part of the journey. Then I found a manufacturer in Mexico and we almost got a visa to Asia, uh, to China in this case. And I'm so glad that we decided to work with Mexico. They're more expensive compared to Asia, but we were in the same time zone and it's such a short flight and we get amazing quality and it's so much easier to communicate. So flew down to Mexico, met multiple manufacturers, selected one who we wanted to work with who had the capability to do what we wanted to do, but was small enough to take us seriously enough. So that was, there have been amazing partners. And after five or six rounds of prototypes, we finally, I was happy with the fit. We passed the ESCM testing and launched with just one model. I love that. So you said your orders were coming. And so what happened next? How did you start to, to add more, more models into your offering? Yeah, so after we launched the first model that is designed as a walkthrough boot because it has a little heel in the back that is based on Canadian CSA standards because the U.S. doesn't have any heel height limitations, we got so many requests for additional models. The second model was the Omega boot that has a lower heel and electric hazard certification, a slip-resistant outsole, and a steel toe cap. And we were able to expand our product line only because we have were able to raise funding two months into launching our business. It was not a huge amount, but it really helped me to hire the first team member officially because we had so many friends helping us on the side in the evenings and on weekends. So that was really awesome to be able to hire my first team member and invest in new product development. And you still had your engineering job and, and this was something that it was kind of a side hustle. Were you figuring it out? Tell us about that. Yeah, it was a side hustle for a while and until we got accepted into an accelerator program. So by the time mm -hmm. we had the product ready, we passed the ASTM testing. I got accepted into an accelerator program that helps you to really launch and grow the company but you have to commit full-time and I decided to quit my job at that time it was actually really good timing I finished a massive project for one of my clients they were really happy it was kind of the perfect cutoff point to do this full-time it was a little scary scary because you lose your it's so unknown lose your health insurance was relying more on my husband and but it was the right move like Sarah Blakely often says, failure is not the outcome, failure is not trying. So I decided to give it a shot. I love that. And so how did you overcome that fear? Because obviously that is a big step and you are taking on risk. So tell us a little bit about the conversations you had with yourself to overcome that fear. I decided to give it a real try. I think because I was more accepting of risks because I already moved to the U.S. I was actually born in Kazakhstan, moved to Germany, so I was very adaptable already. 
And I had mm-hmm. such an amazing support system through friends and mentors in Milwaukee. So I felt very confident that this idea would work. But what happened when we launched the company, you would expect that I would have celebrated, like I'll, I'll open a bottle of champagne and have this big moment. I remember sending out a press release to multiple publications. And then when we actually launched our website, I saw multiple pic- pictures of my face in newspapers. And that was terrifying. Like <laughs> that was not a moment of celebration. I was so scared. I started thinking like, oh my God, what will, what if women will hate my boots? What if I fail? And most importantly, what will people think if I fail? And then I started doing more research around the topic of failure because it was just so unproductive to have those thoughts. And I came across the founder of Spanx, Sarah Blakely, who shared her story about launching Spanx and her whole approach of seeing failure differently and using her quote, failure is not the outcome, failure is not trying. As a child, uh, her dad always taught her to try new things and encouraged her to fail along the way. So I tried to. And it took a while to adapt that new mindset. But I think so many of us have so many amazing ideas, uh, sometimes even million dollar ideas in our lives. But because we're so afraid to fail, we don't even give it a shot. Yep. And speaking of failures, did you have any failures in those first couple of years? How did you bounce back? Because I'm mean, obviously starting a new shoe company is not easy to do. Oh, my God. Yeah, there were many smaller things that happened along the way. The first one was completely overestimating the amount of space we had. Initially, we didn't have a warehouse. We ship from a warehouse now. But in the beginning, we wanted to ship from our house because we wanted to save some money, but also have an additional quality control step. And then we realized that the insoles that were supposed to be sanded to a one millimeter thickness in the front were not sanded. So we had to buy a belt sander <laughs> and set it up on our dining room table. And our whole house looked like a huge mess. So first of all, the products didn't fit in the one room that we dedicated for this. Our whole house, our guest bedroom, our living room and dining room were filled to the ceiling with boxes. So there were multiple smaller failures along the way that we had to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me of Shoe Dog. Have you read Phil Knight's Shoe Dog? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a really good book. <laughs> I is so good. It's one of my favorite leadership biographies. And it's just so inspiring to see how he made Nike happen. But I remember going like, I don't know if I could live with my entire house filled with shoeboxes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really crazy. Or Alberts had a story where they placed their first order of shoes and then realized that the men's and women's were made on the same last. <sighs> but they didn't have more money for additional materials or production so they just told people to take out the insoles and like try to squeeze in so i can't imagine having the first production run be so messed up but they made it through (laughs) they make great that's great before you started your business had you been in leadership roles had you learned how to manage people and then what was that transition like to starting your own company and then having to lead people yeah before i started the company i was a a project manager and was supporting massive multi-million dollar projects and helped teams develop project plans that were lasting two to three years and mm-hmm. were multi-million dollars in budgets. And the biggest lesson I learned from that was you will get the best outcome if you don't tell people what to do, but instead include them in the decision-making process and allow them to write down the activities they will in the end have to perform and we'll ask them how long it will actually take. It really drives accountability. So that was one of the biggest lessons I learned from successful project management. And when I started this company, I had to learn how to build a team and lead a team. So I needed new systems and we briefly talked about EOS was a new tool that I had to implement to help create In the beginning, in the startup environment, everyone wears multiple hats and it becomes Mm -hmm. very difficult to separate the tasks that you're doing. So running on EOS really helped us to understand who's responsible for what role and help us set measurable goals, not only on an annual basis, because if you set goals only once a year, you may forget about them four months in. Setting quarterly goals seems to be the most effective way for us and really inspire people 
to do their best every single day. Yep. And I know that you like the concept of radical transparency. I do too. I believe that when you tell people the truth, they can handle it for the most part and that they're going to be so much better off. And a lot of people don't. They don't share information. And so people feel like they're left in the dark and it causes all kinds of issues. So I'm a big believer in radical transparency. How did you decide that was how you wanted to run your company with this idea of we're going to tell everybody and make sure everybody understands what we're doing as a company and encourage them to come up with their own ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I got the radical transparency concept through Ray Dalio, the author of Principles. Mm -hmm. And that just made a ton of sense to me. It has its ups and downs. And also coming from Germany, I also already had the more direct approach. Germans don't sugarcoat things. Yes. They are very direct. So I had to learn the sandwich method in the U.S. where you say something nice, then you, you have your actual message, and then you wrap it up with um, a positive note <laughs> in the end. So I had to learn it the hard way. I think radical transparency really helps us to get to the point faster and allows us to get the best idea to the top. I really like this idea of running a company not as demo a democracy, but a meritocracy, because not everyone needs to be involved in every company decision. There are things on the operation side that I allow my three team members to decide where I'm not involved at all because I don't at the right value. The same thing applies for branding or marketing. Not every single person on in a team meeting needs yep. to be part of that vote. And I encourage everyone to challenge ideas. And when we brainstorm, everyone's opinion is being heard. And my goal is to get the best ideas to the top through the radical transparency concept. The downside is I had to build a very thick skin because if I share transparency with my team members, it will come back to me and I get feedback from them all the time on things that I can do better. So if you decide to implement that or anyone decides to implement that in their team or company, you have to be ready to, to get the yeah. transparency back. I really appreciate you said that. I am a believer that feedback is a gift and that there's always a way to own something in feedback, no matter what, even if it doesn't necessarily feel true. Because if somebody is perceiving you that way or experiencing you that way, then what can you do to help that situation? I love this idea that feedback is a gift. Tell me how you learned to toughen up, to get develop that thicker skin. Did you always have it or were there times you're like, oh, I don't like this. And uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and you had to work through it. Yeah, I, I, there were definitely many times where I did not take your own medicine. You're yeah. like, oh, that was harsh. And I did not expect it. But I cannot complain it because we implemented this rule, made it part of our company values to have radical transparency as our communication strategy. So yeah, it was tough to adjust. And I think there are still different ways to communicate with different team members. But I think in the end, everyone understands that everyone's opinion is being heard and that the goal is always to do the best for the company and that our goal as a team is to get the best ideas. I love that. So I can imagine that maybe this was an interesting process for people to go through because a lot of us come from environments where it's not safe to, to speak up, to tell people what you think. How did you help people learn that radical transparency was something that you really wanted, right? Not that you just gave lip service to. Did you have to teach people how to be radically transparent? I think after, after getting in, into, I think initially we communicated that transparency is really important to us and then especially in our leadership meetings it would get really heated <laughs> sometimes uh -huh. um yeah it's sometimes a little bit more intense and we run on eos as well and ask them like hey is that okay or is something wrong for our company and the eos implementer said actually inside your internal management team it's totally fine to have these discussions where sometimes people get loud or upset mm -hmm. but you all need to get on the same page because that cannot transpire to the whole team. Like you have to yeah. represent your goals as a team. And I think over time, everyone got more comfortable with the concept. But we have our weekly L10 meetings. It's a one and a half hour meeting that follows a specific agenda. So when we get to the last part of discussing issues and different topics, sometimes it's very smooth. And rarely when we disagree on something, it can get a little a little 
people get passionate about their topics, but it's been working out really well. And I think it's also helpful to have clear values for everyone on the team. And I think Yvonne Chouinard is another huge inspiration to me, the founder of Patagonia, yeah. who built Patagonia so well that he wanted to hire people who believe in the values of the company and don't need to be managed at all. He never wanted to micromanage his team. And he would even leave for half the year going, I think, fly fishing is his big thing. Yeah. And he would tell his team, like, if the warehouse burns down, don't call me. Trust you guys. You know what to do. <laughs> you will figure it out. And apparently his people are so unique that they're unemployable anywhere else. Like, they have a very <laughs> clear... <laughs> <laughs> moral c compass so I, I tried to apply that as well and learn give people work, work with trust I think in his case it would be uh, his book is called let my people go surfing when the weather was really nice he would trust his people to go enjoy the weather and then get the work done when they have to get it done and especially working in this environment where, where you have this remote work culture I think the only way to build a successful business is to trust people and not have to micromanage them that's been I agree. Trust Very is helpful. everything. We're an employee-owned company. And as you can see, I've got own it everywhere. And yeah. we, it's really important for us to hire people who can think and act like owners. And we do have to teach some people what that means because people aren't used to coming into an employee-owned company. And, you know, what does it actually mean for me to own it? And I tell my management team, and I speak about this all the time, it starts with trust. You cannot expect someone to have an own it mindset if you don't trust them. If they don't feel trusted, why would they stick their neck out <laughs> to do something or make a decision that might have some perceived risk or speak up and share an idea if they're not trusted? So that foundation of trust is incredibly important if you want to build a healthy team. I can agree with you completely. Very true. You, ca you cannot punish someone for making the wrong decision. You should learn from it and try not to repeat it again. But if you punish someone really harshly for making the wrong move, people will stop thinking outside the box and will continue doing the safe thing. And that's not how you build a great company. Yeah, agreed. So what are some of the other things that you look at when you are hiring new people to join your team? I think lately we've been looking at people who are really good at executing projects and are really passionate about our cause with the people who want to help more women succeed. That's always very important to us. And who want to be part of a startup culture and not everyone wants to. You have less structure and more responsibility. So if somebody is looking for more of a stable, non-stressful corporate job, that may not be the right environment for them. So I'm trying to always be transparent with the ups and downs. If you want to have a real impact in a company, the startup route is the way to go because your ideas matter, your actions matter. So many more opportunities to have a real impact on what you do on the downside. It, it's probably less stability. You have to wear multiple hats throughout the week. Some people are really good at shifting hats throughout the day, task shifting. I think Elon Musk is really good at this. For me, I have to block off chunks of the day to focus. So understanding yeah. your own weaknesses, I encourage all, all of my leadership team members to get a better understanding about their weaknesses and hire for those. Yep. I agree completely. My company's 45 years old, but I say we're like a 45-year-old startup mm. where we have to keep that adaptability and the flexibility and those new innovative ideas coming. And we've disrupted our industry multiple times over the last 45 years and several times since I've taken over as CEO. And I think it's really hard to do if you aren't clear about what your culture is and how people are going to be successful, what type of people are going to be successful. But I made lots of mistakes early on as I was bringing on executives into my company because I was thinking we're growing. And so I want to bring in somebody who's been in a bigger company and who has this experience that could bring in more systems and structure, which, of course, we need, especially back then. But what I found is that it was really hard for them to thrive here because when you operate like a startup, you, know, you need people who know how to thrive in a startup environment. And that doesn't typically come from big corporate culture. So it was interesting yeah. to think, even though we were getting bigger and more mature, it still is really important to be able to thrive in that kind of environment and making sure you hire people who can. Yeah. One other thing that is really important is the willingness to learn. I don't care if you yeah. like to learn by reading books or watching YouTube videos or taking classes, but I think the willingness to solve things, I think is incredibly important. Yep. I agree. Curiosity. 
It's everything. Mm-hmm. People who are not curious. Exactly. Are, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're not gonna they're not gonna make it working for me very long if they're not curious. <laughs> <laughs> You sound like just such an amazing leader. You know, what do you think your team really values in you and your leadership style? I think the value that their opinions matter. I give everyone the space to have a real impact. I think our quarterly meetings are really, our annual planning session, our quarterly meetings are incredibly helpful. We just, everything is on the table. I ask the team what goal we want to achieve that year. And after that is aligned, I ask them, where do you think you can have the biggest impact? If they want to start a completely new project, like, hey, I want to bring Xena on Amazon, or I want (laughs) one of my team members proposed a few years ago, I think we should get on TikTok. I was skeptical. That was actually (laughs) really powerful. I give them the opportunity to do what they think would have the biggest impact. And I think they all, personality-wise, want to have that impact and have the space here. I think also creating a positive and optimistic work environment truly matters. I think it's been everyone. We have a really good team balance right now. I think we have the right people in the right seats. That makes work more fun. In the beginning, it was a hard grind. And we had more of those, as, as I mentioned, like heated conversations. Right now, I think we're in a spot where we have a very good balanced team where everyone knows what they have to do and want to do. And just providing that space. It's really helpful. And I'm the person with the million crazy ideas. <laughs> yeah. Over time, I learned not to force it on people, but just share my thoughts. And then my integrator helps me to sort out what we actually can accomplish in the next three to six months. I love that. I'm the same way. I'm an ideator. At, and we use the question, is this an idea or a plan? Because people would take my ideas, my brainstorming and you're like, let's just get creative here and then think like that's what we're going to go do. And sometimes things would start to get implemented. And I would say, well, why are we doing that? And it was like, that was what you talked about. I was like, I was just brainstorming. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't a plan. So probably about seven or eight years ago, we started, is this an idea or is this a plan? And that has helped so much be able to set expectations around brainstorming ideas and allows me to be able to be creative and just kind of push things. But then I always, I just did it yesterday with my VP of operations. I said, this is just an idea that we're just ideating here. There's no plan because he's the kind of person that's just going to like run and go make it happen. And so these are just ideas and we're not going to do anything until we come back and regroup and talk about it. But that's really helped um, with that whole people going off and thinking that just because... (laughs) you came up with an idea that it somehow needs to be executed. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'm totally with you. I'm the ideas person. have to be careful when I express ideas. I typically say, this is just me thinking out loud right now. (laughs) Let's use it as a brainstorming opportunity. It doesn't mean that we have to execute for sure. Yeah, it's good to have that space. Exactly. So what is next? What does the next couple of years or five years look like for Xena? What do you hope to turn this company into? We decided as a team that we really want to focus on safety footwear. We have explored apparel a little bit like functional blazers and safety vests and pants. And we realized that one thing we're really good at is safety footwear. And we still get so many emails for additional uh, demands of, for style, safety features. There's still so much to do in that space. So we want to stay focused and expand our footwear development and release more styles. At the, the, at different price ranges we just finished a project with Vibram that we're really excited to launch pretty soon that was a really long project so expand our product line serve our customers love to have a bigger impact on the nonprofit sides every time we run a big sales campaign it's typically twice a year I love to picking a girls nonprofit or women's nonprofit that supports STEM or trades education yeah. And over time, as we grow, I would love to have a bigger impact and help more women succeed and inspire the next generation of girls to explore these incredibly fascinating and well-paid careers. That's wonderful. Oh, that's so good. All right. Final question before we wrap things up. The name of this podcast is Reflect Forward. What does Reflect Forward mean to you? That's a, that's a really good question. I think Reflect Forward to me means to apply the lessons you learned in the past and be open-minded and know that there's still so many more puzzles to solve and so many more skills to learn and 
I stay open-minded with that mindset and learn from other people and help everyone grow along the way. I love that. Great answer. All right. So how can people find Xena Workwear and how can people find you? People can find our website. Uh, it's xenaworkwear.com, X-E-N-A. And you can find me on LinkedIn under Anna Craft, A-N-A, K-R-E-F-T. And we have an Instagram channel, Xena Workwear. So would love if you guys would follow us and give us a shout out on social media. And if you have any request for additional products let us know we have a, a running list of things that we would like to get to so we always appreciate input from our customers and women working in that space wonderful well i'll share all that in the show notes and uh congratulations on starting a successful company you have such an amazing story and i really appreciate you taking the time today to come and share it with us thank you so much for the opportunity and really enjoyed chatting with you carrie Wonderful. All right, everyone, hang tight and I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that interview. So much fun. Please be sure to check out her website, especially if you are a woman who are looking for stylish work boots. I know not all the listeners require those kinds of footwear, but certainly women in my industry do. All right, with that, I will leave you. And if you like this podcast, please share it with a friend, subscribe to it on YouTube or on your favorite uh, podcasting platform, write a review. That's always very helpful. And be sure to check out my book, The Ownership Mindset, a handbook for transforming your life and leadership. You can find it on Amazon or you can go to my website at carriesiggins.com to find it. I so appreciate the support. And with that, thank you. We'll see you next week.